Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum's Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I'm the Manager of Public Programs and Outreach at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy New Year, because this is our first program of 2024. Welcome back to those of you who have joined us for previous programs. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics, stories of the trolley era, our collection, um, and occasionally other cities as well with Pittsburgh connections. So um, usually we do these on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and we're going to continue these as long as we have presenters. So if you have a show that fits our museum mission, please let me know anything about um, the trolley era, especially in Pennsylvania, cities where our streetcars come from. And if you have something that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, please reach out anyway. Um, we've got a full list of upcoming presentations on our website at patrolley.org, which I can share in the chat box in just a couple minutes. And I want to extend a very, very special thank you to those of you who donated when registering for tonight's program. Um, and those of you who have donated through our website, especially for our year-end campaign, we really, really appreciate that. And um, also thank you everybody for your patience with our new way of registering. Um, I didn't really hear about any issues except maybe a confirmation email taking longer than usual to send. Um, please reach out if you had any trouble registering for tonight's program. Okay, so most of you are repeat viewers, but in case you're new, the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum was established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And we opened to visitors a few years later in 1963, and we're actually located along the former interurban route between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. And we've got over 50 trolleys and electric railway cars, a couple dozen of them operate, and over 30,000 <clears> visitors <throat> per year take the four mile scenic ride here at the museum. Um, we've got a couple things that I want to tell you about. I mentioned uh, we were established in 1954. That'll come up again in a second. But we are open for the first time, January, February, March. Uh, we're trying it out. So far, there's been lots of snow, but we've been running trolleys Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 10 to 4. So if you are local or if you're traveling, um, you can come see us. We are open Friday, Saturday, Sundays, and um, trying our best to run streetcars. So uh, yeah, reach out if you're gonna stop by because I would love to say hello. And our 70th anniversary is actually on February 7th. So if you're a Pennsylvania Trolley Museum member, definitely check your email because um, we're gonna have something related to that. And we're gonna have a trolleyology program on the day of the anniversary, on February 7th, um, one of our longtime volunteers, Bruce Wells, is going to do a really neat 70th anniversary presentation. It's actually going to be in person, um, which is members only, and also online on Zoom as usual. So um, I'll send out information about that in um, the next couple of weeks. And if you're local, or even if you're not, on February 10th, we have a volunteer open house. So um, some of you may think you're too far away to volunteer, but we've got people who come from Massachusetts and Atlanta and Philadelphia, which is five hours away and Cincinnati, four hours away. So um, come check us out. Uh, there's tons of stuff to do at the museum. And um, our volunteer recruiter and coordinator, Morgan, has organized this really nice open house to kind of show people um, whether you're interested in trolleys, history, anything, um, what the museum is about. So uh, please reach out if you're interested in that. Okay, and now I would like to introduce today's presenter, Aaron Isaacs. Aaron grew up with the Minnesota Streetcar Museum, which his father helped found in 1962. He's volunteered for 48 years and is now the board chair and historian. He edits the museum's quarterly Twin City Lines History Magazine and has written seven books on Minnesota streetcars and railroads. He's also the longtime magazine editor for the Heritage Rail Alliance. Aaron, if you are ready, you can take it away. All right, thank you. We'll do a little share screening here. Sure, and uh, right. as a reminder, at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with our presenter. The chat box will be open, so feel free to enter questions and comments there, um, or we can read through those at the end. And just to note, this program is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube a little bit later. 
All right, so at this point, I'll ask everybody to turn off their videos and I'll invite you to turn those on at the end. All right, thanks, Aaron. All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, this presentation has only a very tangential connection to Pittsburgh, uh, but uh, I do wanna talk about the, uh, the fleet of streetcars, uh, PCC cars, that were purchased by Twin City Rapid Transit in Minneapolis, St. Paul back from 1946 to 1949, because they are now um, the second largest surviving fleet of PCC cars. They're all over the place, including in Pennsylvania. And uh, I thought it was kind of an interesting story. So um, let's get going. First, I wanna give you a little background on Twin City Rapid Transit or known to the public as Twin City Lines. Started in uh, 1872 as the St. Paul City Railway. Uh, in 1875, along came the uh, Minneapolis Street Railway. Uh, and before the 1870s were done, they were taken over by a syndicate uh, headed by Thomas Lowry. Uh, Thomas Lowry, um, an attorney uh, and real estate developer who moved up from uh, Illinois and uh, got, uh, quickly discovered if you're in the real estate business, you needed to have a way to get people to the real estate developments. And uh, that got him involved in the streetcar systems. He merged the two uh, streetcar companies into Twin City Rapid Transit in 1892. As an aside, he also uh, was the president of the Sioux Line Railroad, but he was a very prominent local citizen and he built the system. And the system wound up having over 500 miles of track. And this is, uh, it extended until 1932, well out into the suburbs. And there were also a couple of privately owned interurban lines that ran out until uh, the, the 1930s. But this is what the system looked like in 1948. And uh, I don't know if you can see, uh, can you see my cursor moving around, Kristen? I don't know if she's... Okay, well, I'm not hearing Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Well, Kristen, can you... Uh, my question is, can you see my cursor moving around? Yes. Okay, good. Then I can use it to highlight stuff. So anyway, this is downtown Minneapolis over here. And then here you'll see a vertical line going down the Mississippi River. And this is St. Paul. And so they really are twin cities. The downtowns are 10 miles apart. And they've always operated as a single system to this day. Um, Metro Transit, the public transit agency, is the old streetcar company. Um, that purchased it in 1970. And what you see here, all the red lines are streetcar lines. Um, if you can see, there are green dash lines. Those are bus lines. So um, it, it really went everywhere that, uh, that uh, development occurred in those times. Now, a little bit of background on the equipment because that really leads into the story of the PCC cars. Um, through the 1890s, they were purchasing uh, streetcars from commercial car builders. So the Clean Car Company, uh, Brill, um, American Car Company. And of course we have a very uh, cold climate here with a lot of snow. And they quickly discovered in the, 19, in the 1890s that uh, little bitty single truck streetcars uh, had a hard time getting through snow. Um, I have newspaper stories of like six of them pushing a plow, attempting to get through the snow. Um, they bought in 1892 uh, some double truckers from American Car Company, and they liked the way they ran. And so starting in 1898, they began building their own. And these are two of the very first ones. It was in 1898, by the way, that they went to the yellow color scheme, uh, yellow and green color scheme. And so they built these standard cars, about 1,200 of them in all. Uh, from 1898 through to 1917. And the design gradually um, developed the original ones. Uh, first, they, they had hand brakes, and then in 1905, uh, they went to uh, air brakes. And then uh, about the same time, they went to steel underframes. And so they kept refining this design, but it basically looked the same all the way up through the end of 1917. Twin City Lines was the only streetcar company that built every single standard streetcar that it ever owned. There were others like Third Avenue Railway and Chicago uh, and, uh, that built a number of cars, but only Twin City Lines built them all. They also built them for Duluth, Minnesota and for a few other uh, cities as well. And it was a very clean, kind of vertically integrated uh, company. I liken it, for those of you who are from Pennsylvania, I liken Twin City Lines to being the streetcar equivalent of the Pennsylvania Railroad. 
whenever they could do it themselves, they just did it themselves. This got all the way down to uh, building their own trucks, building their own heaters. Um, the the uh, overhead wire pole you saw, they had their foundry and they made their own overhead wire poles. They were extremely self-sufficient. But they also wound up, like the Pennsylvania Railroad, making them very conservative and hanging on to designs that were so technically obsolete past their time. And so they started out, uh, this is one of the last cars they built in about 1917. Um, and so there you see, this is a, a, what we call the gate car, triple stream gates in the back. Everyone got on at the back. And it, of course, they, they found out that uh, they had traffic jams in the back. Everyone had to get on and get off uh, and uh, in the back. And as a result, uh, you had congestion there. And so about 1920, they put front exit doors in them. And uh, they ran some of these until the very end. Um, and so along came the lightweight trend in streetcars and as well as making them out of steel, uh, generally from about 1915, 1920, 1925, that era, uh, Twin City Lines developed their own lightweight car. They built about 30 of these, as well as a few for some other cities. Um, no steel, uh, steel underframe, but masonite sides. Um, they built their own truck for it, and they were not incredibly successful, but they pretty much lasted until about 1950. However, Alone, I think, among some of the big streetcar companies, Twin City Lines never owned a steel-bodied car until they bought PCCs. See what the next one is. Uh, what they did do when the Depression came along and ridership uh, was cut in half from the peak, and the peak, by the way, was uh, 1920, uh, and so it parallels what happened with other systems. Um, instead of building new streetcars, what they did is they took the old uh, cars and they... Uh, they converted them to what they called one man, two man. And so they put in, uh, they replaced the uh, hand operated gates in the back and the single exit door in the front with air operated double stream doors. And depending on the line, they either ran them with a, with a motorman in the front and no conductor, in which case you entered in the front. And you can see there's a, a sign here that says entrance. That means enter in the front. Or if they were running on a heavy line with a conductor, they would have uh, an enter in, the, enter in the back or an exit sign up here, and you entered in the back. Um, and so this is the way um, about the last 500 of the streetcars looked, uh, including our streetcar number 1300 that we have at, uh, uh, at our museum. Uh, by the way, this is a Nicollet Station, the ladder track going in there. So, oh, uh, here's another view. Um, they, they took some of them later, starting in the late 1930s, and they would, uh, they uh, steel sheathed them, but other, otherwise they were simply the same car. They, Twin City Lines had a very high level of maintenance. Uh, they would take them in every five years to the main overhaul shop and tear them down completely and replace everything that was needed. Okay, whoops, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, uh, comes along about 1931-32, and the uh, Electric President's uh, Conference Committee is formed to try to go and make the great leap forward in streetcar technology. And what they wanted to do was to get about the 25 largest streetcar companies to invest in this effort, and they invited them to become members. And they invited Twin City Rapid Transit, who turned them down. Uh, they were not the only streetcar company to turn them down, but once again, Twin City Rapid Transit just kind of did things their own way. And, uh, and so they were not part of the PCC development effort, even though, um, even though they eventually bought them. But they bought them um, after almost everybody else in the country had bought them first. Uh, there were only a, only a couple of uh, places that bought them after Twin City Lines. So they, made, they placed an order in 1944 with St. Louis Car Company for 40 PCCs. Now, the order didn't get filled uh, and uh, because of strikes and supply chain issues at, at, uh, at uh, St. Louis Car Company. And so in 1945, um, they said, we really do want to try a PCC. And so they diverted car 1547 from the Pittsburgh order and had it brought to the Twin Cities. And here it is at Snelling Shops, which is the main overhaul facility 
of Twin City Lines on the transfer table. And they brought it in, and for, oh, about 18 months or so, it was the only PCC in the system. And they made kind of a PR splash with it. Now, by the way, 1547 was an air electric. And in 1945, it was actually a good thing that their order did not get filled, because 1945 was when PCC design made the transition from air electric, air meaning air compressor with air brakes, air doors, um, air horn, um, to uh, all electric. And so their delayed order wound up being all electric. But first they wanted to, they did a little publicity with 1547. Um, that is the uh, superintendent of maintenance there. This is posed inside Snelling shops. And um, that is one of the World War II motorettes. Motorettes was what they were called here. Twin City Rapid Transit said, we're not going to give them a gimmick name. We're going to call them operators. And on her hat badge, it says operator but they wind up being called motorettes. That, that's Donna Turbus, and she and her sister uh, both uh, hired out uh, starting in 1943. Uh, Twin City Lines hired uh, 474 of them, if I remember the number right. Most of them lasted just through the war, but four dozen of them stayed after the war, and the last one retired in 1980 as a uh, Metro Transit bus driver. So they brought the cameras out, and so, of course, what did you do back then to publicize anything? You put attractive women in it, including one of the real motorettes. And here you are on the transfer table. I'm guessing these are probably women uh, who worked in the office or something at Twin City Lines at Snelling Shops. Here's some of them posed in the car. Um, and you'll notice this is the Pittsburgh um, seating system with uh, side-facing longitudinal seats ahead of the rear door. Um, and because it was a World War II, uh, construction, uh, you'll notice it is painted steel poles, not stainless steel poles. That was one of the uh, accommodations uh, for that. They do have the Twin Cities car cards in there. Um, I see Gross Brothers Chronics, which was industrial uh, uh, launderers. They're still in business. And here's a bunch of less attractive people in the back of the car. Uh, they must have done some kind of a uh, of a run for local business people. These are kind of chamber of commerce types, I think. And here it is uh, on Fifth Street at Hennepin Avenue. And you'll notice the sign to St. Paul. And the, the premier line in the system, you could argue, was the Minneapolis to St. Paul via University Avenue, which, by the way, has been duplicated by the Green Line Light Rail. And there is a, state, there is a light rail station at this exact spot today. Um, one side note, the, uh, this line opened. It was the first line between the two downtowns actually connecting the cities. Before that, the streetcars did not connect with each other between the cities. And that line opened in 1890, and it was called the interurban. And to the best of our knowledge, it is the very first use of the term interurban anywhere in North America. And Within Twin City Lines, it wasn't called that to the public, but within Twin City Lines, it was referred to by the operating folks as the interurban until the streetcars quit. And one more thing, uh, this, this was a cartoon in the newspaper, and the purpose of the cartoon was to advocate for uh, putting route numbers, uh, assigning route numbers to each route and putting it up in the destination sign. But what's interesting is they picked uh, Pittsburgh car 1547 and changed the color scheme in order to publicize it. So what happened to 1547? It was retained, was numbered 299, the lowest number to the PCCs. Uh, they wound up, uh, there were 140 more that were ordered. This one is passing through the University of Minnesota on the interurban. And those buildings you see in the background are temporary buildings that were built um, after World War II to accommodate the flood of, uh, of former soldiers coming in on the GI Bill. So anyway, it was, uh, they went and ordered, uh, they got their order, the first order of 40, and that was followed by two more orders. Uh, the first one showed up in late 1946. Now, who is this gentleman? This is Bill the Motorman. And Bill the Motorman was to Twin City Lines as Betty Crocker was to General Mills. Uh, he, was, he was the genial uh, advertising voice, and uh, he would appear on car cards, he would ask people to be courteous and, uh, you know, move back and not, not crowd around the exits and, uh, you know, uh, 
please be kind to the motorman. And he also will go to advise the motorman, you know, be, be good to the public. So uh, Bill was around for a long time. And here he is welcoming a PCC car. Here's a logo with one of the new PCCs. And here's the very first one arriving, car 300. Uh, the Milwaukee Road had spur tracks right up to, uh, right into the Snelling Shop Complex. And so they offloaded them from flat cars and built, uh, built these grids. And um, this was to take it off the flat car, it's backing off. And by the way, one thing you'll notice, Twin City Lines practice, if you look up at the end of the trolley pole, that's a seven inch trolley wheel. Uh, we didn't use shoes, we used trolley wheels. And uh, that allows you to back up uh, as well as go forward. And to this day at the museum, since we cannot turn the streetcars around, we run backwards at 15 to 20 miles an hour uh, because of those wheels. And here's a later order in 1948 or 49 coming in. You see they're up in the 400 series now. Now they purchased them with, uh, fair, with conductor stations in the back. They didn't keep them in there forever, but on the heavy lines, they still had conductors on the light lines, no conductors. And so here's what they look like. This is down at the corner of Hennepin and Washington, kind of a major intersection in the middle of downtown. There you see one of the standard cars behind it. And I'm just gonna show you now a bunch of scenes of them operating in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, that's in front of the state Capitol on Wabasha Street in, in downtown St. Paul. Uh, this particular, about a couple blocks of street has been removed. This is now all just part of the Capitol grounds. But this once again is on the inner urban um, between Minneapolis and St. Paul. This track was also used by the Como Harriet Line, the Rice South St. Paul Line, uh, and the Hamlin Cherokee Line, because we're right on the north edge of downtown St. Paul. This is East Side Station, and it was the oldest of the car houses. Uh, they had six car houses. Uh, this was the only one, uh, they had built a whole bunch of them in the 1890s, and this was the only one to survive. Uh, a wood frame building. Uh, they had had uh, car house fires at the other and others, and they went and built uh, five uh, concrete fireproof car houses, pretty much to a standard design. But this was the last one in service. It's across the river from downtown Minneapolis. Now, here we are at that same spot, the same spot I showed you where the LRT station was and car 1547 was boarding. Um, if you look to your left, it's kind of in the shadows, but you can see a little hut right here. Uh, that was uh, where a, a full-time starter was based. And the starter was an on-street supervisor. Uh, his job was to keep the cars on time, short line them if you needed, give information to the public. Out in the middle of the street is a safety zone sign. Uh, and these were used mostly in downtown in an effort to keep the people, there could be crowds of people waiting to get on out here and you had automobiles passing behind them. And so it was, it, it was a, an effort to keep them safe. In some places they later put in traffic islands. This is a uh, 7th and Wabasha in downtown St. Paul, which was really the biggest intersection in downtown St. Paul. Um, this one is another car on the inner urban now, even though it's just coming into downtown, it says to Minneapolis. This line and the Como Harriet line, for some reason, what they did in downtown St. Paul was simply make a large loop, oh, about a, a half mile loop, loop through downtown St. Paul and head back to Minneapolis without taking any layover. So that meant that it was a, a 21, 22 mile run for this thing without any layover. And on the Como Harriet, it was mm, about a 30 mile run without any layover. And so uh, there was also just out of the camera to the left, uh, there was another starter's booth. And if he had guys bunching up and coming in late, you can see a, left, a track to turn left and he had a short turn, look, turn loop, which could go and kind of pick up 10 minutes and get him back on schedule. This is downtown Minneapolis. This is the corner of 6th Avenue, uh, 6th Street and Marquette. Uh, this is the Nicollet Avenue line. Uh, when they brought in the PCC cars, they uh, assigned them line by line. Uh, and basically to all the base service on a given line. Uh, and then they'd run standard cars for trippers during the rush hour. And the reason that they wanted to go, well, first, the old standard cars by this time were, uh, you know, 30 some years old. And, um, we're getting a little bit tired. 
uh, the, the PCCs were very popular with the public. And of course, they were much faster. And so um, they, they could definitely outperform a standard car. And so you had less car bunching in the off-peak if you had all PCC cars. And plus, it, it allowed them to get rid of some of the old standard cars and reduce the wear and tear. Um, in, in the crossing, that is the interurban, the Minneapolis-St. Paul car crossing on Fifth Street. And so I'm just moving around the system. This is the corner of Snelling Avenue and Minnehaha Avenue in the St. Paul Midway. The Midway is the area between Minneapolis and St. Paul, but it's within the city of St. Paul. It's kind of the western part of the city. And this is the Hamlin Cherokee line, which was one of the lines that was uh, converted all to PCC car. It's crossing the Snelling Avenue crosstown, which was the biggest crosstown line in St. Paul. And here you are in downtown St. Paul, this is on the St. Clair Payne line. You're at the corner of, uh, of 7th Street and Robert. And this is kind of in the heart of the retail district in downtown St. Paul. And there were streetcars on Robert, as you can see. This is Glenwood Park, now called, called Worth Park, out on the western edge of Minneapolis, technically in the suburb of Golden Valley. And uh, the, uh, the car has pulled and backed into the Y. Twin City Lines uh, had a number of turn loops, but the large majority of their ends of the line, they used Ys and backed in. Um, that shelter, interestingly enough, is still there. It was built in 1937 by the WPA, and it's still there, only it's not next to anything. Okay, uh, the Como Harriet Line, while the uh, interurban on University Avenue was undoubtedly the busiest line, and always considered kind of the premier line in the system, one of the near runners up was the Como Harriet line. And the Como Harriet line was the longest in the system. It went between Minneapolis and St. Paul to downtowns via Como Avenue, which is somewhat indirect compared to University Avenue. Um, and in the process, the Como portion of that is that it went through Como Park. And this is, you're seeing the station for Como Park. There's a lake, a zoo, uh, um, a, um, a little amusement park for kids. Como Park is the biggest park in St. Paul. And so just out of the camera, out of the frame to the right, the park board built a big stone station, which was a waiting station. Uh, they put a pedestrian bridge over. And by the way, this right of way is a bike path today. The platform still exists. The bridge has been redone and the, uh, the station is still used by the park board. And when it has a big meeting room in it, and they put in a terrazzo floor with a uh, with a map of the Twin City streetcar system in the floor, which I think is kind of cool. So anyway, they had about a mile of private right of way through the park, and then they took Como Avenue all the way basically to Minneapolis. And after Minneapolis, they extended all the way into Southwest Minneapolis through what we call the Lake District, and then out into the suburb of Edina and Hopkins. And that line, uh, previous uh, until 1932, went all the way another 12 miles out there to Lake Minnetonka. So it was a really big line and, uh, and the most scenic line in the city. There was a lot of private right away in southwest Minneapolis as well. It was the last line to operate in 1954. Uh, this is down on the north edge of downtown uh, where the Nic Nicollet Avenue and Hennepin Avenue and First Street all converged. Uh, this is a Nicola car headed for 2nd Street Northeast. It has just turned off of 1st Street onto Hennepin, uh, where the road bends up here in the future. That's it crossing the Mississippi River onto Nicollet Island and then across. And this is the main post office to the right. And out of the camera to the left is the Great Northern Station, where uh, the Great Northern, Northern Pacific, Burlington, Chicago Northwestern, Minneapolis and St. Louis and Chicago Great Western uh, have their trains. It was one of two stations in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, this is on the Como Harriet line. It's uh, passing under Linden Hills Boulevard, just west of Lake Harriet. And um, underneath where the camera is standing is uh, part of our car barn. Uh, that's where we are today with our streetcar museum. I'll show you a picture later. <clears throat> and this is the Lake Harriet station. And uh, we run there today. It's uh, single track with a passing siding today. Uh, the station was uh, built in 1912 uh, jointly by the Minneapolis Park Board and the lake is off to the right out of there. Lake Harriet has always been a major uh, destination in Minneapolis 
uh, the, uh, the streetcar company started, uh, held the entertainment uh, franchise for that from 1886 until 1902 and started regular concerts there. And those, uh, the park board took them over in 1902 and in the summer from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day, there is a free concert every night at Lake Harriet. And uh, a lot of that is why we are happy to have a streetcar line there because we get a lot of riders. People see us and they come over. We carry about, oh, 25,000 a year there. Uh, so the building was not only a waiting facility, but it had a kind of a candy shop, ice cream shop, confectionery, a dining area in it. In the basement, there was storage for the park board and a holding cell for the park board police. And this is a little further north, and this is once again on the right of way where we, we run. Uh, we're on uh, the uh, Interlock and Boulevard Bridge, uh, and right below us is a stop called Cottage City. Uh, there was a little development. The, the line runs between two lakes. Uh, we have a mile of track here, and uh, on the south side of what was called Lake Calhoun um, was a development called Cottage City, an attempt in the 1890s to sell lake homes, and it was unsuccessful. But this is where the streetcar stop was for that, and the stop remained uh, to the end of service. Okay, um, the uh, Minnesota Rail Fans Association was a classic rail fan outfit that started in the late 1940s and was active uh, up through the early 1960s. And they chartered everything that was neat and cool to ride, including many trips on Twin City lines. And now there were only PCCs that were. Um, assigned to uh, to uh, particular lines. And so there were a lot of lines that never had PCCs just because there weren't enough PCCs to cover all the base service. And so what do trolley fans do? They said, let's take PCCs where they haven't gone before. And so uh, one of the lines was the Matamidi line, which was uh, the about 10 mile remainder, suburban remainder of an interurban line that went out all the way to Stillwater, Minnesota, about a 25 mile trip. And this thing actually continued until 1951, and we're about a uh, we're about a block from the end of it in the suburb of Matamidi along White Bear Lake. This is this is called Hamlin Lake right here. And then they took one out to Hopkins, which was the remainder of the line out to Lake Minnetonka. This particular one, back in the day when it went to Minnetonka, they had a, a group of about two dozen. Uh, Minneapolis Twin Cities built streetcars. They looked like the standard streetcars, except they had metal cow catchers. Well, for those of you who are Pittsburghers, you know how they put cow catchers on the inner urbans uh, uh, running out to Washington and all. And I know you have one of those. It was exactly the same thing. They put cow catchers and marker lights on the front of their standard cars, put 75 horse motors and tall gearing in, and they came through here at 60 miles an hour. So anyway, this is a PCC, uh, a photo stop. You can see the guys with cameras because they cut it back to Hopkins and this stretch of about four or five miles was the remainder of that inner urban line to Lake Minnetonka. Um, another interesting line was the intercampus line. Uh, the University of Minnesota has the, their big main campus in Minneapolis, not too far from downtown. And then over in St. Paul, uh, they built about four miles away, they built their agricultural campus. Minneapolis is a big farm state uh, with, uh, with uh, test plots for agriculture and another big campus. And in 1914, um, they built a trolley line between the two campuses. It used the Como Harriet line for about mm, two miles of its route, but its entrance to both campuses um, was, uh, was something they built and own themselves. And they hired Twin City Lines as their contractor to run it. And, and so they ran cars every uh, 15 minutes between the campus. Um, the fare collection was completely separate. Um, there was reduced fare student punch cards. There were no free transfers uh, to uh, other lines. Uh, it was his own little world. They collected fares the old fashioned way. There were no fare boxes on. The conductor went and punched cards and collected cash fares and simply put them in his pocket and rang it up on a fare register. The other thing about this is they hauled freight. They needed coal for a power plant on the St. Paul campus and the periodic supplies. And so they had an interchange here with the Minnesota Transfer Railway. And of course, trolley fans being trolley fans, 
Uh, they want uh, they want all the rear mileage they can get. So when they went and did their PCC charter on the intercampus line, they went and ran it up the interchange track for a little bit. And here they are out on the uh, Minnehaha Fort Snelling line at the entrance to Minnehaha Park, uh, where they left the street and went on to private right of way. And here they are cruising through the yard at Lake Street Station, which was one of the six car houses, um, which, which did not have PCC cars. Uh, this particular trip, um, this is they, they did it on the Chicago uh, Fremont line, which was a big line, but it had been converted to bus. However, this was one of those legal deals where tra uh, Twin City Rapid Transit in 1953 converted it to bus before the city of Minneapolis gave formal approval. So for two or three months following that, that they were required to keep the overhead wires hot and the tracks open and run a franchise run at night once a month. And so the Minnesota Rail Fans guys seeing that, uh, hey, the line was still open, let's go and run a charter on it. And that's what this is. So there you're seeing the bus down at the end of the line of 54th in Chicago. Okay, so um, a hostile management to streetcars came in and uh, assisted by a guy from National City Lines, they start, proceeded from 1950 to 1954 to get rid of the streetcars. And so um, in 1953, by in 52, they got rid of all the St. Paul lines, except those that went to Minneapolis. In 53, they got rid of those. And the last uh, streetcars went in 54. Well, the PCC still had value. Once again, there were 141 of them. So uh, they started selling them in 53. And uh, the first group went to Mexico City. And they hired Twin City Lines to go and repaint them, you know, uh, overhaul them, repaint them, renumber them. And this is one of the uh, Mexico City cars. And what they did with them is they kept the same car number and they put a two in front of them. Um, and so this is, uh, this is the uh, superintendent of maintenance for Twin City Lines shaking hard uh, hands with the superintendent of maintenance from uh, Mexico City. Um, and so there's, and here's one on a flat car getting ready to go. Okay, then they, uh, Shaker Heights said, we would like some cars. And uh, I think it was 20 of them to Shaker Heights, if I remember. And Shaker Heights said, we'll take 15 of them. I will take five of them as single unit cars as is, just fix them up for us. But we want the other 15 to be multiple unit. And so they hired Snelling Shops to go and MU them. And here you can see the work in process where they've taken off, um, uh, they've taken off the, uh, uh, the people catcher underneath, uh, the, S, uh, the lifeguard and put in a coupler and uh, new, new bumpers and all that. Uh, here's uh, two of them being worked on. Uh, you can see uh, this one, 345 is gonna be MU. This one right here has been repainted. It's gonna be one of the single cars. And here's another one they're working with up on the hoist. Here's one parked. And so once again, there's a maintenance superintendent. That's 63, which by the way now is, uh, is at Illinois Railway Museum. It survived. It's really about the closest thing to a shaker survivor uh, today. Uh, there are some junk shaper, shaker cars around, but I think this is the only one. Uh, it's, it's operational. Um, even though it needs a lot of work. And here, uh, here's what the car is getting ready to go out. Okay, now let's look at them where they ran. Here we got a couple of pictures on Mexico City. Now Mexico City modified them. This is as they were originally done. But if you look at this one, they went through several paint schemes and you'll notice that they, uh, it, it, they narrowed the double stream doors. It's just a single stream door. They went and added a window back in. They also went and replaced the windshields at some point, uh, took the wings off. Uh, you'll see the windshield is flat. It's not recessed anymore. And let's see, do I have, okay. Uh, here's a later color scheme. You see now they've added turn signals to them. Uh, they've got uh, a left side rear view mirror. And this one shows they put left side doors in. I guess they had for center running like this, I think they probably use center islands. Uh, these are clearly new rear windows, turn signals. Um, 
So they modified them a lot. Do I have another? Okay, yeah, there's another one that really shows. Um, and they, um, in 1981, they retired them, but they uh, used parts from them to create LRT, LRVs with um, articulated LRVs made out of PCC parts. I don't have a picture of one of those. And those ran to like 2000 or 2004, something like that. And they saved one of them. And this one is at the Railway Museum in Mexico City. I don't quite get that the number font, but as you can see, it's got the left-hand doors in it. So it's not operating, but it's there. Okay, now here we are at Shaker Heights. Here's one of the MU cars. Another one running in train. And of course, they uh, they would MU them with the, uh, the the Pullmans that Shaker bought themselves. And so the Shaker cars, uh, after they were retired, most of the uh, some of them were scrapped, but some went to Buffalo, New York, and they were going to do something there in Buffalo, and it never happened. And so a few were sold again to another project that never happened, although it, it's, it looked like for a while it would. And this was the Brooklyn Waterfront streetcar line in Red Hook's uh, a portion of Brooklyn. And uh, there was a guy there, I can't remember his name, but he was he was kind of a transit gadfly and he tried to make this thing happen all by itself and it didn't happen. And so this is one of the ex-Shaker cars and it got scrapped. There is 63. Um, and 63 went to, uh, 63 was in the, uh, I'm sorry, was in the um, Trolleyville Lakeshore Electric Collection. And if I recall, I think in the sale, it went to Electric City Trolley Museum, but I believe uh, they, after a while they reconsidered and it went to IRM. So IRM actually has two of, the, two of these cars, one from Newark and one from Cleveland. And so you can see this is one of the multiple unit ones. Okay, Newark. They simply sold them as is. And uh, here they are at the Newark shops and uh, running in the Newark subway. And I, I, I rode these once. They just went like hell. These cars were very fast. They used to say in Minneapolis, they ran them on University Avenue. And they said they would beat a car off the line. They would top out at about 50 or so. And, um, of course, they had no speedometers, but cops would pull them over every once in a while. So here's another view at one of the stations. And more. Now, and, of course, this is in the bed of the old Morris Canal, for those of you who don't know. And the line was built in 1935 or 37. It was actually a rather late. And it had a it had a bunch of off ramps for local lines, but eventually I think it's like 4.5 miles or so was was this just back and forth. And of course, it's since extended with LRT, and so uh, New Jersey uh, Transit uh, took it over, and uh, you know painted the cars this way. Uh, they got rebuilt at various points with new seats and such. Now this is car three. And car three and car, hmm, I'm forgetting the other one, 27, um, were sold in 1978 because uh, Shaker Heights was short of cars. And so these two cars went to Shaker Heights in 78. Now, this is the one that we got. And the reason that we wanted it was after Shaker Heights used it for a couple, three years and then let it sit. The reason we wanted it, it had all the original seats in it. And um, so I'll, I'll tell you the story about that in a bit. Um, when they converted the uh, Newark line to light rail, uh, the light rail cars didn't have the acceleration of the PCCs and they had to lengthen the schedule. Here's number three running at Shaker Heights in the New Jersey paint scheme. So, of course, the final New Jersey Transit uh, with uh, what they call it, the disco scheme, and uh, they put pantographs on them. Um, they had extended the line um, to a transit center, oh, another mile, half mile or so on the end. And here's what they looked like with the pantographs in their last years. That says 2014. Hmm, 2014. Well, I know they, uh, they stopped using these in 2001, so that must be a late copyright. Okay, so where did these go? 
New Jersey Transit kept a bunch of them for a while and then eventually decided that they didn't need them. And so um, this is at Rock Hill Trolley Museum, number six. They had to put a, a front trolley pole on it. But this was the first one uh, of the ones that Newark kept to be uh, restored, restored a few years ago. Uh, this is car 26. That's Matt and on there for all of you who know Matt. And that's a really recent view. That's like in the last week or so. Uh, and they had the car is painted uh, and it's it's well on its way to uh, running again. Of course, it, it had to be regaged for Baltimore wide gauge. And it looks like it's just back from the paint shop. And so um, this is now I know this is at Rochester and Genesee Valley Railroad Museum. I'm a little confused as to whether they've got this one or this is the one for New York Museum of Transportation, uh, which is. Uh, because I, I thought Rochester didn't have one. I could be wrong on that. But there's several of these that once uh, New Jersey Transit got rid of them that scattered around the East Coast. And so uh, number 25 is at, uh, hmm, now, I'm, now I'm forgetting. I think, uh, I, I think oh. Shoreline. Yes, this is Shoreline. Thank you. And um, now here's the other one. We got both of those ones that went to Cleveland. And this is number 27, but we didn't have a, perv a need for it. We got them both. Uh, and so we traded it to Shoreline for parts. So Shoreline has this and they have 25. So I don't know if they're gonna do one as Minneapolis, one as uh, Newark, or if they'll do two different versions of Newark. Uh, 27 is sort of operational, but not very. Uh, this is at, at Seashore, number five. Okay, now one of them uh, went to Rock Hill, I, I believe, went to Rock Hill, but then was purchased by uh, San Diego and completely restored. They also have an ex-St. Louis one that they've restored, and it runs uh, the loop from the waterfront and through downtown. This is the only Twin City one that they have. And of course, they numbered it in the San Diego and put it, this, put it in San Diego colors. Okay, now we get to the 11 that went to San Francisco. And um, they, they took them out there, uh, did kind of a, a, a mechanical redo and body redo on them, and then quickly discovered that they, uh, they had door problems and electrical issues and all. And so they sent them back to Brookville and they have now been remanufactured twice and running a course on the E line and the F line. And so the 11, as San Francisco has done, has uh, repainted them in the colors of uh, cities that ran them. So this is Detroit. But once again, these are all Twin City cars. Here's Birmingham, Alabama. And there you see a Philadelphia car painted Kansas City in the back. Uh, El Paso, Texas. Cleveland. Um, Los Angeles, next to an original Iron Monster from San Francisco. DC Transit in Washington. Toronto. San Diego. Um, I guess that's another Mexico City. Hmm, maybe they did too. I'm not sure. Oh, no, no, that's Mexico City. The other one I was thinking about was Detroit. Sorry. Uh, there you go. Uh, appropriate that is in newer colors and it's a Twin City car. And of course, the one they painted in Twin City colors. Um, interestingly, the, um, I think, uh, uh, the, uh, they already had a car in Shaker Heights colors, an ex Philly car. So it would have been appropriate for a Twin City car to be in Shaker colors, but they had one already, so they didn't. Another uh, picture of that. Okay, a word or two about our museum. Uh, we were founded in 1962 to save this streetcar. It's one of two of the standard wood cars that survived. Uh, the other one is car 1267, which is out at the uh, seashore. And uh, the Minnesota, there are two guys from the Minnesota Rail Fans Association, which was our predecessor organization. And in 1954, they went down to the company headquarters and they said, you're getting rid of them, can we have one? And they gave them this. And uh, it had been uh, through the shop uh, just a few years earlier, one of the last cars to get shopped, so it was in fairly good, decent condition. And it was literally 
one of the last two cars to carry passengers. Uh, the system quit the last line, which was the Como Harriet line through here, quit uh, June 18th of 1954. On June 19th, the Minnesota Rail Fans Association chartered this car and car 1775 and made a tour of the remaining track. So anyway, it was put out on an industrial spur out in, uh, in Hopkins, Minnesota, and it sat for eight years and started to deteriorate. And they figured, you know, we got to do something about that. And so uh, they formed our museum the, uh, at the time, the Minnesota Transportation Museum is what we were called. Uh, brought it over to the Minnesota Transfer Roundhouse in St. Paul. And that's where I first got involved. Uh, my father, George Isaacs, joined the group to rehab it. I was 13 at the time. I am 74 now. And uh, I remember dad saying, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm going to spend too much time on this. And then he was involved for the next 45 years. Um, so they went, they patched it up, put a new canvas roof on it, rigged up a little generator on a hand car, and it ran. And the next summer, we took it out in the railroad, railroad yard uh, and just ran, started running it back and forth about a half mile round trip. And people started showing up. And over the course of several weekends in July of 1963, we hauled 8,500 people. And we all looked at each other and said, what the heck did we tap into here? And we decided we needed to become an operating museum. And we looked all over and eventually in 1969, uh, negotiated an agreement with the park board to uh, use this abandoned right of way, which was still in, intact a mile of it because it was in the park. And so we started operations uh, in 1971, uh, completed our mile of track in 1977. And here you see it as it is today, a single track except for the passing siding. Um, and we, we've got additional cars. Um, this was car 1239, which was made into a cabin. They sold a lot of bodies like everyone did for cabins. And this thing, you know, no, no trucks, no motors or anything. Um, and we had been out there scavenging bodies. And so we had a lot of seats and, and things like that. And so this one, it looked exactly the same as 1300. In other words, it was in the one man, two man with the doors. We backdated it. We had a set of gates. Uh, we got we we had scavenged a set of the bulkheads uh, from uh, car bodies, and so we we've been able to backdate it. Right now, this car is out of service because we're building new trucks. The, the trucks that are, you see under it are a pair of unpowered Chicago 4000 L car trucks um, that we slapped a couple of old steeple cab motors in back in the late 70s, and th they were worn out. And so uh, we're in the process of using some of the components off. Uh, we got some Peter Witt motors from uh, Toronto, completely rebuilt them, and uh, we're in the process. We've cut new components, and we're in the process of manufacturing new trucks for this. Probably be another year or so. Here is our station at Lake Harriet. It is on the site of the original station, the one I showed you. Uh, there you see 1300 next to our PCC, 322. 322, when we got it, it was tired. Um, it had to be completely rewired. It had all new floor, lots and lots of body patching because of rust, all new step wells, all new doors. Um, we had to go and splice the legs of all of the seats uh, because the pipes had had uh, the seat pipes had uh, had rusted through. Now Metro Transit was a great help. Not only did they acquire the car for us. They got, it to, they got it from Cleveland and then donated it to us, but they let us put it in their heavy overhaul, bus overhaul base for five years. And that attracted the attention of the, of the body shop guys because we were right next to the body shop. And uh, they really helped us with the body work because we hadn't done a steel car before. And the, uh, they painted it uh, in their uh, state-of-the-art paint shop and then it moved over for four years to our line here and we finished it. And so it was a nine year restoration, but it really, it's a really nice car, goes like crazy. Um, here you see it out on the line. And that's our car barn. It's been, it's been built in five stages. Um, this is a very, there you see Lake Harriet on the left in the winter. This is a very high amenity neighborhood. And so we wanted to be as unobtrusive as possible. So this is the south end of our line and we're kind of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and so the neighborhood, though, has adopted us. And uh, we are now, uh, our streetcar is now the sign 
the, the symbol of this particular neighborhood. And then this is our other line at Excelsior. And this was built after, as part of the Minnesota Transportation Museum, which then got into railroads and buses and a Lake Minnetonka steamboat. It was a steamboat that was operated by the streetcar company and built by them. And it had the same colors, the same seats, the same wood finishes as the streetcars. And this is out in the suburb of Excelsior on Lake Minnetonka, which is a very large resort lake. And uh, the streetcars went out here. That was the 60 mile an hour line I was telling you about and uh, met the boats and the boats, there were four routes that traveled hourly to every point on the lake. So that boat was restored and operating. And the guy who uh, oversaw that operation as part of our museum said, I would like to go and replicate the transfer of streetcar to boats. And so we got a T21 grant and built the streetcar line. Well, uh, it never met the boat. It comes near, but it doesn't meet it. And the boat guys really didn't care anything about streetcars. And so we, the streetcar guys, took it over. And when the Minnesota Transportation Museum split into three in 2005, it had become really just too big and unwieldy. Um, and so the Minnesota Transportation Museum is now the railroad part at Jackson Street Roundhouse in St. Paul and the Osceola and St. Croix Valley Railway, tourist railway between Minnesota and Wisconsin. That's the Transportation Museum. Uh, the steamboat became the Museum of Lake Minnetonka, and we split off in 05 and became the Minnesota Streetcar Museum and, and including this line. And so, um, um, and by the way, this worked out best for all three organizations, it decentralized management, and it, it really, it kept the money separate and it was a win-win all around. Uh, these are our other cars. Uh, on the left is Duluth, car 265, which was built in 1915 for Twin City Lines. Twin City Lines built all the streetcars for Duluth, which was a subsidiary. And so Duluth needed streetcars in World War I and they sold this to them. And when they one manned their cars in 1928, they did it a little differently, which is why that front end is kind of asymmetrical. Next to it is a car 78, which was a little a Laclede single trucker from 1892 that was built for Duluth and wound up as a shed in someone's backyard. And it was really just a shell. And we debated whether or not to even try to do anything with it. But then one of our members uh, bought a, a Brill uh, power truck from Brussels, Belgium, and that was the impetus. And so now it, it goes like crazy. And of course, it's a little hot rod because in Brussels, they hauled trailers with it. Uh, and then the car on the right, is a Winona, Minnesota, number 10, which was built by St. Louis Car Company. It's a single trucker, although you can't see it. Um, and it's uh, in 1912, and it's like a pre-Bernie wood composite, wood steel composite single trucker. And it ran in the town of Winona, Minnesota until 1938, uh, and it became a cabin. And it went for sale and we got it. Uh, and it was a 15 year restoration effort, which is just completing um, and so it, it, it runs now and uh, the power truck under it is a story in itself. Um, it, it, was, it was built with a DuPont power truck, which was an, a power truck that they last stopped building in 1915. Uh, St. Louis Car Company built them. And we, uh, we said, well, is there any chance of finding a DuPont power truck? Well, there were, there were um, three of them in existence. Um, two of them under streetcars at museums already, and one that was in the Trolleyville collection. And it was in the Trolleyville collection because it had been used to, um, to electrify a Lancaster, Ohio horse car back in about 1900. And the Lancaster little system quit in about 1935 and the people who owned it put two of the cars, including the car that was the former horse car uh, in a shed and kept them. And the Ohio Historical Society found those cars, took the, um, the horse car, removed the power truck, backdated it to a horse car, and the truck wound up in the Trolleyville collection. And just at the time that we were restoring this car, Trolleyville conveniently went out of business and we were able to buy the truck. So it's got the right power truck under it, believe it or not. Now, I think this is my last, oh, I'm sorry, I got one more slide and this is it. So I went on, there, there is an excellent website that is done 
by uh, Jeff Hackner at Connecticut Trolley Museum. And um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm blocking on his name at Illinois Railway Museum. Um, and it's the surviving electric cars. And these guys have found every body, every car, and it's very up to date on the status of those cars. And so when I was doing this, I thought, I wonder how many PCCs are still around and where were they originally from? And I, if you can read this, you can see the biggest fleet is Philadelphia. There are 85 of them. There's a total of 307, followed by Toronto and Boston PCCs, followed by Twin City, Twin City Lines, then Pittsburgh, St. Louis, San Francisco, Kansas City, and so on down the line. Um, of course, a lot of them, you know, were sold to other cities, but these are the original cities. And I also went through and discovered that 107 of them are either operable or are actively under restoration. And I don't have it up here on a slide, but just so you know, the Philly cars are the, are the most in operation or restoration, 36 of them. And of course, that, a lot of that has to do with them running them on, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on that line. Um, next in line are the Twin City cars with 16 operational, followed by 14 Toronto cars, 12 original San Francisco cars, and seven Boston cars, which are mostly the ones that are running on, on Ashmont and Mattapan. Folks, that is, my, uh, that is my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing screen and turn it back over to you, Kristen. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, I am gonna uh, get to question and answers in just a minute. So if you'd like to type one in the chat, feel free to do that or uh, just hang on. I'll let you unmute in just a minute. But really quick, before we get to that, I did wanna let everybody know what's coming <coughs> up. Um, I mentioned earlier, we've got our 70th anniversary trolleyology. Um, February 7th. And if you are a member, please check your email because there are details about an in-person version of that in your inbox today. Um, and then uh, we've also got in February a Beaver Valley Traction presentation coming up from George Gula. And this one is going to be really, really exciting. So even though it's off in June, I wanted to put it on here. Um, we're hosting a special um, international trolleyology um, from one of our friends uh, in the Netherlands who will be presenting on Rails to Victory, the kind of little known history about Allied rail operations after D-Day in Europe. So that should be really interesting um, on the anniversary uh, or roughly of D-Day. And uh, right after that, we'll have our Anything on Wheels weekend, the 8th and 9th, and of course the West Penn Trolley Meet, June 7th and 8th with an excursion on the ninth, uh, details to be announced. So lots coming up at the museum. Would love to see a lot of you during that West Penn trolley meet. It'll be a lot of fun. And uh, I wanna thank everybody again for joining us and especially Aaron for sharing that presentation. Um, if you'd like, you can support the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum at patrolley.org slash support, which I'll pop in the chat in just a second here. Thank you again to those of you who donated while registering. Okay, so um, lots of nice things coming in in the chat here. Very interesting, terrific presentation. Um, I know I had a question which um, is probably answered by not PCCs, but, um, oh, and also you can turn your videos on now if you'd like as well. Yeah, by the way, can you take down uh, your screen share so I can see everybody? Yes, let me put, uh, okay, we should be able to see everybody now. All right, okay. Um, so, uh, I had a question about like snow fighting equipment. Uh, so the, the PCCs were running alongside older cars, right? So they didn't need any like, like snow fighting equipment, like new snow fighting equipment. I'm guessing like most systems, it was, it was older stuff, right? Well, Twin City Lines, because snow is a big deal in the Twin Cities, um, the, they had 17 heavy plows that, uh, that they plowed the streets with. They had sand and salt cars. Uh, every uh, every streetcar had sanders on it um, that they could sand. And so it really wasn't the job of the PCC for the most part to okay. have to go through bad snow. Although what, uh, the, uh, what I've read is that they actually handled themselves pretty well. Oh, okay. And then um, I had a second question. The I don't know if they're catchers or retrievers, um, but on the backs, they're like way up higher than the Pittsburgh's one. Is, was the, did this just vary between systems or? They uh, were, uh, well, it was actually on car, uh, I'm sorry. 
for some reason, Twin City Lions put him up there. And I think the reason was that it was very easy on the PCC cars for kids to come along and grab the trolley rope and dewire them. And by putting it up there, uh, they didn't have that problem anymore. The problem was that it was really difficult. Um, you had to lean out the window and uh, and try to find the trolley rope. And they actually went and put a an upward facing mirror on the rear of the car. So you were supposed to look down and see where your hands had to go. And by the way, those mirrors, you know, got covered with trolley grease and snow and dirt, and they took them off after a while. And I have one photo of a shop man, and he's leaning out the rear, and he's twisted around and looks terrifically uncomfortable, but he's pulling down the trolley rope. So uh, when when my dad was responsible, my dad led the restoration of RPCC, and he said, screw it, we're going to move it down below the window. We're not going to subject our volunteers to having to do that. Wow. So, so, so that, that's one non-prototypical thing that we did. Okay. Uh, and then I did uh, let everybody unmute themselves. So uh, Steve, I think you, you had something to say. Oh, or not. Sorry. <laughs> this is Andrew. I have, um, Kristen, can I share my screen to ask a question of Aaron? I have one photo I'd like to share. Uh, let me do that. Okay. You should be able to share now. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to have to do that, and then I will zoom in on the picture. Um, you may. This was okay. a picture I took uh, ten or eleven years ago um, at the museum. Uh, I don't remember the name of this gentleman, uh, Aaron. Uh, that, that that's Scott Heydrich, who just passed away last year. Oh, oh sorry to hear that. Long time um, volunteer. But yeah, he was a volunteer um, when I was out for uh, a Friends of Two Six One. Uh, a two-day trip, uh, one up to Duluth and one to, well, not quite Duluth, um, what's, the, what's the place called, Boylston, and the other one to Winona. Um, he was a volunteer on that train and then invited me to visit both the museums and, in fact, let me uh, drive one of the trolleys. So <laughs> I was wondering, I'd lost contact with him, so I was wondering, what. Uh, sorry to hear that he passed away. So some of you guys have visited uh, before. That's good to know. Um, and actually in the chat, Aaron, uh, someone just asked if you've done other presentations on streetcars. And I know there are plenty of them on YouTube, right? Yeah, we have a museum YouTube channel. If you go into YouTube and in the search box, go Minnesota Streetcar Museum, you will see our logo come up. Click on that, click on videos. And I have about 50 slideshows on, uh, as well as five programs with vintage video of when they were running. And well, actually it's four programs with Twin City vintage video and one with Duluth vintage video, which Duluth quit in 1939. And so actually finding color footage of Duluth was, wow. was surprising to me. Um, so yeah, you can go on there and see all that stuff. We started doing that uh, during COVID. Uh, the same time you started doing trolleyology, yeah. our response was to put these slideshows on. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's been a great way to connect with other museums across the country and, and keep people engaged, members near and far. So I'm sure you guys have had a, a similar experience. Yeah, thousands of views, you know. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments for Aaron tonight? Got to get uh, out to yes. Minneapolis. I'm sorry, who was that? I said I got to get out to Minneapolis one of these days. We'll start <laughs> running in May. Okay. Yeah, I have to say thanks. It's an excellent program. Kristen, could I uh, share the screen for a moment? Because uh, I have a question for Aaron about the uh, intro picture he had in front of the state capitol. Uh, sure. I, I, I took a couple of pictures, uh, Aaron, of the uh, uh, LRT line uh, around the state capitol. And can you tell me if, where these are in relationship to uh, the photo that you had in the intro? This one. Okay. Um, let's see, where are we? Oh yeah, we're at park. Okay. Um, the streetcar, uh, the light rail goes behind the Capitol. The uh, streetcar went in front of the Capitol. So you're looking at the east behind the Capitol. And the reason they went that way was uh, to uh, access a major hospital that's about two blocks east of the Capitol. 
the largest hospital in St. Paul. Okay. Now, um, the, the LRT is on University Avenue. The um, one, one block behind the camera, about half a block behind the camera, was where uh, the uh, streetcar diverged and went uh, at a 45 degree angle right behind the photographer on, uh, on Wabasha Street that doesn't exist anymore. You go there, there's a sidewalk today. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the Green Line Light Rail, once you get at Rice Street, which is right behind the camera, is, is then on the old streetcar line um, all the way to Minneapolis with a couple of short exceptions. Is this the side of the uh, Capitol that I have up there now? Where? Yeah, the, uh, what you're you're looking east, and the, the light rail is on the north side of the Capitol. The streetcar ran on the south side of the Capitol. I, I, I just put another image up, Aaron. So. Oh, I haven't seen oh, it yet. Oh, uh, yeah, we can we can only see the last one. You might have to do a new share, Richard. Oh. Uh, or let me. There, there may be people dumber at technology than me. <laughs> I haven't met them. Uh, okay, I stopped you sharing that one, so now you should be able to share your next photo. Okay. Um, uh, let's just see. Oh, yeah, we see your whole photo folder there. You see it now? Well, you got to double click on it to expand it. Oh. Uh. Yeah, we might not be able to see because I think you've shared the the window uh, as no. opposed to the single photo. Okay, it's uh... yeah. If you um, yeah, if you share desktop instead of uh, share that window, you, we might be able to see it. But um, if you have it open on your desktop, yeah, I do. Okay, now now uh, you got to double click on it on your desktop. I think. Are you seeing it? Not yet. No, not yet. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not going to monopolize your time. <laughs> no, there's, there's other people that will have questions. Yeah, in the meantime, uh, Curtis, do you have your hand up? No, I'm actually just resting my head on my hand. Oh, um, okay. I didn't know question. you were raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do have a question for Aaron, and that is, has anybody from the Society for Industrial Archaeology said anything about possibly visiting the museum in May when its annual conference is going to be in Minneapolis? Well, I know about the Society, but I didn't know they were meeting here, and uh, I haven't heard from them. So uh, are, are, are you one of them? Well, I, I intend to be in Minneapolis in May for that, that meeting. Uh, I'm not one of the organizers. I'm not sure who's organizing that particular conference, but I suppose huh. I will uh, send a note uh, asking around. By the way, I, uh, when when in May is it, do you know? Uh, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll go to the other computer where I've got the calendar easy to see and be back. That's fine. Yeah, you can come back. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, does anyone else have questions or comments for Aaron? Uh, yes. Go uh, ahead. Fred, Fred Cosgrove. Um, very good presentation, Aaron. Uh, but on the last slide, I noticed uh, you didn't have Detroit listed for PCC. Hmm. Uh, uh, hang on a minute. Yeah, because there's uh well 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 I, I thought I had it on there. Well I um, did see it. Well just a minute here. Let me do uh oh you know I did leave it out, didn't I? Okay, sorry about that. I did yeah, take they it have... out there. They're, they're included in the three hundred and seven, but I forgot to go and put it on the slide. So okay. sorry about that. You know they got two PCCs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah. One from uh, Detroit, one from uh, Toronto. Mm -hmm. By the way, you're not related <clears throat> to Pat Cosgrove, who is one of our volunteers, uh, is it? Are you? No, but okay. I did have an Uncle Pat. So that's <clears throat> no. about as close as can come. All right. <laughs> okay, Curtis, you're back. Did you want to report back? <clears throat> Yes, yes. Uh, I actually stuck it in the chat. The uh, the oh. SIA meeting is going to be from the 16th to the 19th of May. Okay, well, the reason I'm saying that is that on the 18th and 19th, which is the Saturday-Sunday, 
there is a big event called Doors Open Minneapolis. Uh, maybe you, maybe there's Doors Open ones in other cities as yeah. well where you get to go behind the scenes of, and there's like a hundred venues and we're one of them. And so we're open for car barn tours yeah. um, on, on the 18th and 19th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So, uh, and by the way, if, if you're guys, I mean, there, there's every kind of place you can think of, uh, government, industry, retail, you name it, that are opening the behind the scenes stuff on the 18th and 19th. I'll bet they know about that. But I'm thinking frequently, you know, the Sunday, the, the usually the papers are on Saturdays. And then Sundays, they'll often have kind of an extra tour in the morning and maybe nothing in the afternoon. Because I remember when the conference was in St. Paul, it was the St. Paul Railroad Station that we toured on Sunday morning. Okay. Well, in any event, if they don't know, let them know. So, uh... yeah. All right. Uh, any questions for Aaron about his presentation? All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you again, Aaron, for your presentation. We'll have this on YouTube within the next few weeks. And in the meantime, you can go edu educate yourself on the Minnesota Streetcar Museum uh, <laughs> YouTube and watch tons of historical uh, slideshows and like hours and hours of Aaron presentations. Mm. It's, it's good stuff, really. Um, and thank you again for joining us for our first program of 2024. Um, and I hope we will see you either at the West Penn Trolley Meet or some other time during the year, either online or in person at the museum. Oh. And uh, if you have an idea for a trolleyology, please reach out. Um, you can email me at kfred at patrolley.org. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your week, everybody.